Good morning, bonjour, bon dia, salam alaikum. Good. Uh, my name is Dr. Joel Amego again. I'm the moderator for this morning's session, session seven, Youth, Peace and Security. Let me highlight a few points to set the stage for today's conversation. Africa is at a crossroad. Africa is facing a major demographical challenge. According to the recent UN forecast, the continent is expected to double its population by 2050, from 1 billion to nearly 2.4 billion inhabitants. Most importantly, half of that population will be less than 25 years old, which raises the urgent question of whether African economies have the capacity to absorb the million of new arrivals that will soon flood a job market. The term youth is today associated with a range of socially mixed attributes on the continent. For example, rebels in search of a cause or in the opposite side, young nationalists and the continent's future. Some domestic observers have gone so far as blaming the youth insurrection on foreign interference. Theories underlying the relationship between urbanization and transformation have been challenged by trends in many African countries, since many have yet to observe their own green or what we call industrial revolution. The median age on the African continent is 18 years. You've heard that from the presence of Ghana and other speakers. Compared with Asia, 31 years old, in North America, 35, and in Europe, 42, according to the Melinda and Gates Foundation. The truth is the growing youth population is both an opportunity and a challenge for the continent. The frustration and the hopelessness of an unemployed young population can in its extreme have a severe consequence, something not only witnessed in Africa, but across the world. The World Bank estimates that 40% of the people who join rebel movements are motivated by the lack of economic opportunity. The situation is also complex for young girls who may face a, multi a multiple of challenges, including a lack of access to reproductive health, education, and employment opportunities. Whilst there's no country on the, on, on the continent today that has not tried to respond to youth demands in one form or the other, the reality is that few governments envision the youth challenge as a labor of love, rather as, an, as a threat to the Bali politic that must be eliminated. Experience suggests that there is a tendency for youth targeted policies to be generic, poorly funded, and lacking in operational concreteness. Few countries have attempted to assess whether the policy targets that they set in their youth policies frameworks are achieved or working. And of course, political inclusion that the youth are demanding is often not forthcoming. If we agree that Africans, especially African youth are highly resilient and resourceful, people as mentioned by the Ghanaian president in his keynote address, then we need to ask ourselves this morning, can Africa seize the opportunities being presented or do African youth constitute a, a, a ticking demographic time bomb? Can African youth give the continent an advantage? Can the energy of African youth be harnessed to drive economic growth and lift the region out of poverty? The African continent now stands at a crossroad. With that, let me introduce this session. Few things we'll do today. The session will identify the main uh, peace and security related issues impacting youth in Africa. We'll discuss the gaps, challenges, and priorities of youth in peace and security in Africa. Examine the key components of the continental framework for youth, peace, and security. We'll examine the role of leadership and security sector leaders to promote youth engagement in the security sector. I have the honor to introduce two panelists, distinguished panelists, I can call them friends at this point. Uh, on my left, Mrs. Chido Cleom Pemba, and then uh, on the screen, uh, Mr. Victor Ochen. Mrs. Chido uh, Mpemba is a special envoy on youth appointed by the chairperson of the African Union Commission. As the youngest diplomat and senior official in the chairperson's cabinet, 
She is a Pan-African youth advocate on a mission to use her strength, influence, and voice to lead work that changes the lives of young people in Africa. She has worked with various institutions to coordinate activities focused on social equity, peace and security and policy advocacy. She is a Mandela Washington fellow who was selected under President Obama's Young African Leaders Initiative. She's part of a global shapers community, an initiative of the World Economic Forum and has led leadership roles, including being selected as part of the global tax force representing the Africa region. Mrs. Mpemba has a strong private sector experience, having started her career as a banker at the Standard Chartered Bank for seven years. She also worked with the Zimbabwe Minister of Youth, Peace and uh, Youth, Sports and Arts, Culture, World Olympians, Kirsty Coventry. Mrs. Mpemba holds uh, an MBA from Midland State University and a bachelor from the University of Cape Town. Thank you. The second panelist is Mr. Victor Ochen. Uh, I'll share his story. Uh, Mr. Ochen is the founder and executive director of the African Youth Initiative Network. He was born in uh, Northern Uganda. He has spent 21 years of his childhood as a refugee in the camp, where he survived on one meal a day for over seven years. He grew up amid violent conflicts that displaced over 3 million people, where 60,000 children plus children were abducted and forcefully recruited as child soldiers, including his own brother. His organization has so far provided reconstru reconstructive medical repair to over 21,000 war victims of rape, mutilation, and gunshots. Challenged by the hardship of war and poverty while living in the camp at the age of 13 years, Victor formed a peace club and bravely led the anti-child soldiers recruitment campaign amidst the war in Northern Uganda. He grew up to become one of the most important figures in Africa, a key reference when it comes to the struggle for women's rights and justice, a product of resilience and personification of struggle. Forbes magazine named Ochen in 2015 as one of the 10 most powerful men in Africa, while Archbishop Desmond Tutu attested that my heart swells with joy to see Ochen as one of the new hopes for the continent. He is the first Ugandan and the youngest ever African nominated for Nobel Peace Prize in 2015. Ochen has received several awards. He is the UN Goodwill Ambassador for Peace and Justice, promoting the Sustainable Development Goals 16. He is a member of the Global Advisory Group to the UNHCR on Gender, Force Displacement and Protection. So let's start our conversation. Uh, the conversation will start with Mrs. Uh, Ms. Uh, Chido on my, uh, on, on my left. Uh, We've asked her to share, you highlight some of the major issues and security challenges faced by young people in Africa and what the drivers of these challenges are. She will share with, with us some of the AU and UN commitment to address peace and security challenges facing uh, young people in Africa within the youth peace and security agenda. And of course, what could security sector leaders here uh, and, and abroad do now in terms of leadership policies and institution to promote youth engagement in the security sector and implement the youth peace security agenda. Then I'll move straight to Mr. Victor Chen. And based on his experience, he will share the potential contribution of youth in efforts to maintain and promote peace and security on the continent. He will share with us some of the challenges hindering the implementation of the youth peace and security agenda, share some of the positive developments in the implementation of the youth peace and security agenda and also share some lessons learned. And he'll conclude with some advice for security sector leaders in this room. So without wasting any time, I'll give the floor to uh, my colleague and a friend, uh, Ms. Chido. Thank you very much, Dr. Jewel. It's such an honor to be on stage. And not only that, but to be participating in this program. I mean, honestly, I've learned a lot as well, uh, you know, forming part of, of, of the groups and in the discussions that we'll be having during the week. And uh, most importantly, so that I get to represent the young people. I mean, you did mention that Africa has the largest population being young people. So it's very important that they're represented in the conversations that we're having um, you know, during this program. And I've seen that coming out, in fact, in, in, in most of the discussions that we'd be having, that youth seems to be a cross-cutting theme across all borders. 
and you know it's a need for us to 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 ensure that they're included in the decision making processes as well so i will speak uh based on my experience being a young person and from there i'll move on to the foundations and the foundations focusing on some of the au policies that are being implemented currently and i'll move on to the gaps and challenges that have been identified and finally the proposed solutions, because I believe that in as much as we can talk about the challenges, we need to come up with solutions for young people, which is the now and the future generation. So speaking of experience, being in this role, coming from a private sector background and, you know, getting now into a political space as a political appointee, what I've realized is that everything is cross cutting and you find that when you look at young people and in terms of what they need, Mostly it has to do with economic development, social development, and there is that theme that goes with that to ensure that if they have their needs met in terms of economic development, creation of jobs, access to financing, when it comes to social development, looking at humanitarian issues, as well as, you know, just basic access to, 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 to public health, for example, then that creates peace for young people. When their needs are not met, then it creates conflict. So you find that there's a way that it interlinks between um, the various themes. Now, looking just directly into the, the aspect of peace and conflict, you know, youth in Africa are often perceived as the main perpetrators of political violence, social unrest, and violent extremism. extremism. And popular protests across the continent are often explained by the socioeconomic and political marginalization of the youth. Likewise, the surge of proliferation of arms and violent extremism in the past 15 years also tends to be associated with the political and the socioeconomic dissatisfaction of young men and young women too. While young people are particularly susceptible to violence and crime, they're also burdened by social and economic insecurities and are often victims of violence, political unrest and terrorism themselves too. More than 600 million young people globally live in fragile and conflict affected areas, a large proportion of them being in Africa. And considering that a rising youth population in Africa, the faster growing in the world, intersects with a number of threats to peace and security on the continent. And it is no wonder that this growth, which will continue for at least the next three decades, is widely perceived as a social political time bomb that we need to look at now as a matter of urgency. In co conflict ridden regions of the continent, political instability, unemployment, radicalization, forced migration, and the effects of climate change too, acutely affect young people. And evidence suggests that these threats take a more per per pervasive nature when considered in the context of a rising youth population, which we have today. This has been further compounded by advancements in social media and the shrinking of political spaces in Africa for young people. I think yesterday we spoke a lot about cybercrime as well, and this interlinks. Relatively stable regions in Africa uh, when we look at in relatively stable, stable regions in Africa, youth are also facing deepening social and economic problems. And the youth population increase will add to the existing problems such as inadequate access to education and jobs, which we see today, and the gap in skills and the jobs that are available for young people. Large numbers of foreign migrant arrivals and the overall pressures of urbanization, thanks to the population booms and the citizens, moving to cities from rural areas will put additional stress on these developing economies that we have. These are likely to reduce the economic opportunities and well-being of young people across Africa, thus creating a vicious cycle that we see today. In Africa, a real perceived exclusion and lack of representation has been the most consistent underlying cause of violence and armed conflict. If we look within the leadership spaces. Majority do not have room for young people. And that has created a lot of tension. The onus therefore is on policymakers to enhance their understanding of these factors 
and to make policy processes more inclusive of the youth in Africa. We have the largest stake in the outcome of these decisions. Policymakers must also avoid the conceptual trap that portrays youth as either victims or perpetrators of violence. And instead, we should draw upon the increasing evidence that shows youth to be agents of and assets of peace building. Now, given time, I think I'll just move on to the foundations and some of the programs that AU has come up with to ensure that there's inclusion of young people when it comes to peace building processes. When you look at foundations for youth peace and security in Africa, particularly at the African Union, the AU Constitution Act 2000, Article 3F and 3G of the AU Act highlights the promotion of peace, security, and stability on the continent and the promotion of democratic principles and institutions, popular participation and good governance as core objectives. The declared principles governing the AU also underpin its commitment of youth peace and security, particularly when you look at Article 4C, I and M also call for the participation of the African people in the activities of the union, the promotion of gender equality and respect for democratic principles, human rights, the rule of law, good governance too. When we look at the AU Peace and Security Council protocol, under Article 3 notes as a key objective of the promotion of peace and security and stability in order to guarantee the protection and preservation of life and property and the well being of African people and their environment, as well as the creation of conditions conducive to sustainable development. Article 20 mandates that the Peace and Security Council to encourage non governmental organizations community-based groups and other civil society organizations to participate actively in the efforts at promoting peace, security, and stability in Africa, and to ensure that we include young people in these processes. We also have the African Youth Charter within the African Union. And so far, 17 member states have not ratified this youth charter, which is a governing document for young people when it comes to our rights. This specifies the rights, the duties, and the freedoms of African youth and their constructive engagement in decision-making processes and the developmental aspirations of the continent. Article 11 specifically provides for youth participation in all spheres of society through active involvement in decision-making bodies and processes and the equal access of young men and women in decision-making, priority attention to marginalized youth and provision of technical and financial support to build the institutional capacity of youth organizations. Article 17 highlights the important role of youth in peace and security through the strengthening of the capacity of young people and youth-led bodies in peace building and conflict prevention. Use of education amongst others to promote a culture of peace and tolerance among youth and mobilize youth for the post-conflict reconstruction, rehabilitation, reconciliation, and development of affected areas. And the reason I'm highlighting this is because I think there's a need that within the member states and across sectors that we are aware of these articles, how they benefit young people and how it's important that countries ratify the African Youth Charter. When we think, look at the African Union um, Agenda 2063, which is pretty much almost aligned to the Sustainable Development Goals, specifically Aspiration 4, calls for a peaceful and secure Africa based on functional mechanisms for peaceful prevention and resolution of conflicts and the nurturing of a culture of peace and tolerance in Africa's children and youth through peace and education. Aspiration six, six specifically also states an Africa whose development is people driven, relying on the potential of African people, especially as women and youth and caring for the children. Now we've spoken about these aspirations, but my challenge today is how do we ensure that this moves to action? How do we ensure that with key deliverables? How do we ensure that we implement this and it becomes relevant to young people? beyond the speeches, but more concrete action for young people. 
We also have the APAYA, for example, the African Plan of Action for Youth Empowerment. And within the APAYA, this framework and decision serves as a basis for AU and the member states overarching problematic documents to guide and influence the efforts and contributions of key initiatives when it comes to young people. And there's a need that when we look at most of these documents that are governing the member states across Africa and within the African Union, that we implement across sector level, even within the security sector. How do we ensure that this is cross cutting and how do we ensure that we build an Africa that we want that's inclusive of young people and ensure that they're represented at these spaces when we speak about peace and security. AU's engagement with civil society, for example, we have the youth peace and security agenda. And this is a product of the AU commitment of engaging civil society groups in all aspects of its activity. As expressed in the 2008 Livingstone formula, the mechanism set up by the Constitutive Act of the African Union. And specifically within my role, when we look at the civil society, I've made it intentional that I engage with young people on the ground. Currently, I'm embarking on a 60 days youth engagement tour across the continent and in the diaspora. And the whole purpose of this is to actually sit down with young people on the ground, visit marginalized communities, visit um, young people that have been victims of violence as well, to ensure that we gain a full understanding when we speak to them in terms of the challenges they've really been faced with and what they would propose as solutions. Because it's one thing to sit on the table and we come up with solutions for young people, but it's another when we include them in this extra solutions. So we need to be very intentional as well as policymakers, as security leaders to ensure that we include them in, in conversations, we include them in discussions, we include them when it comes to the decision-making as well. And um, we have the Youth for Peace Africa program that was implemented within the African Union. Currently, uh, we appointed Youth Peace Ambassadors. So each and every region in Africa has a Youth Peace Ambassador that's representing that region on peace matters. And they also sit within the Peace and Security Council, which we get the opportunity to, to, to also attend and forms part of intergenerational dialogues where we present the challenges that are faced with young people on the ground. Recently, we had a visit to Burundi uh, in the month that Burundi had the cha chairmanship as, uh, under the Peace and Security Council. And we held a continental dialogue, which is hybrid on specifically the youth peace and security framework, continental framework, because within the African Union, we also have the youth peace and security continental framework that should also govern the member states. And within this framework, we had young people also contributing in terms of recommendations and what they think you know, should form um, part of um, the amendments within this framework. And we presented this to policymakers as a declaration of Bujumbura, because this event happened in Bujumbura, as well as to the head of state to say, look, as young people, we do understand that there's this framework, but we wanted to sit down amongst one, one, ourselves um, as peers and also contribute to this framework and see where there can be areas of amendments based on what we've seen on the ground and based on the conversations and the experiences of young people. And we've been able to present that. And it was also an opportunity for the uh, Youth Peace Ambassadors um, you know, within the different regions to speak as well specifically to young people in their regions. Because what we've also realized is that not all size fits all. So it's important when we're coming up with these programs that specifically we zone in on the different regions and where possible on the countries too and how they're affected when it comes to peace and security um, issues. Um, given time, I don't know how much time I have left because I can go on and on. Yeah, I have five minutes. Ooh, okay, so now that I have five minutes, I think I'll just quickly move on to the gaps and challenges um, that we've also seen when it comes to this. So, you know, despite the range of commitments and the array of existing initiatives that the African Union, the youth groups and other institutional stakeholders working in peace and security in Africa have been involved in, there have been some constraints. And I'll just name a few of these. Firstly, limited financial resources for youth initiatives. There are few financial resources available to and for youth-led groups 
and initiatives on peace and security in Africa and globally for young people. A survey on 399 youth organizations working on peace building globally indicated about 50% operated with less than 5,000 per annum and only 11% operated with more than 100,000 per annum. And this stunts the role of youth in peace and security arena. There's intense competition for resources that results in inadequate collaboration and synergies amongst young group, with, amongst youth groups because the access to funding is limited. Secondly, there's lack of coordination among stakeholders. Youth related initiatives on peace building in Africa suffer from limited platforms and mechanisms for inclusive engagement and coordination between and among youth groups, governments, intergovernmental institutions, civil society organizations, the private sector, development partners, and the media too. There's a need for more coordination collaboration. Okay, I'll, I'll give two more, if that's okay, thank you. Um, weak organizational and technical capacities of youth groups. A majority of youth groups and associations lack the institutional and technical capacities required to attract or access limited financial and technical support available and to effectively document, implement, and evaluate the impact of their programs. So because of time, I'll, I'll just end here. And hopefully when we get into the focus groups, I can get an opportunity to, um, you know, speak more on this. Thank you. Thank you, Chido. I'll give the floor to Victor on, uh, on the line. Victor, over to you. Oh, yes. Uh, thank you so much. And I, hello, everybody. Greetings from Kampala, Uganda. Uh, as introduced, my name is Victor Chen. I'm a Ugandan. Uh, I'm happy to join and be part of the dialogue today. I think the questions, the talk at hand, the issues to discuss is pretty much something that if we seek to find real solutions, we need to also go a bit more practical meaning taking uh, the well titulated documents, uh, tools of operations into practice, not just having always fantastic policies, which we put in and we do nothing about it. I am talking from experience point of view. Just before I joined this call, I was on a call with uh, uh, the late Archbishop Desmond Tutu Foundation and in terms of sustaining the legacies of, of Archbishop Desmond Tutu and tremendous leaders we have had in the continent. And the question is where are young people in terms of embracing the spirit to which the struggle was exhibited by our senior leaders, our forefathers. And then um, along during the week, it's also been an exhausting journey. I am saying this because we need to know where are we in terms of thinking aloud, Thinking practical has been exhausting last two weeks when we are, we've been contacted as an organization formed in Uganda, started from Africa and in Uganda to support the victims and survivors of war. Uh, we've been contacted by experts, psychiatrists and psychologists in Europe who are working very heavily to support the victims and survivors of war in Ukraine, especially supporting the women who are victims of uh, sex as a weapon of war and children who have been uh, affected by war, they've been separated, they've been made child-aided families, they've been made orphans or physically injured or even recruited at their earliest age to join the forces. So this is the kind of development. They looked around the world to find their experts all over the world qualified with perfect academic uh, skills and success but they lack one practical, one thing which is practical knowledge. And that's why they looked down to Africa, they came and asked us. So we have been doing, we already started the process of providing training and supporting the frontliners, the caregivers uh, who are working with the Ukrainian refugees, both in Ukraine and those who have fled to the neighboring communities. So we're happy for what we're doing. And it's also a good opportunity that for the first time, uh, always humanitarian, uh, intervention is seen with a Eurocentric lens or superpower uh, uh, mentality. But now we are saying for us to stand up and be part of the global community, 
solidarity must lead us, but also we must have a feeling that we all belong together. Support can come from any part of the world. And I think this is really something that is important. Why I say this bit is when, to talk about, to answer what we're talking about today, let me give from an example, from my personal point of view. Having been born and raised in conflict, I'm very happy that I can speak fairly good English today, but majority of my age mate, my generation never made it. And if I'm to look through, I reflected through how I even got to be where I am. Sometimes I don't know it, but I think it's also something that I have to celebrate because having been born in that kind of situation where you're struggling with acceptance, your safety, your security, your education, your health, you are blinded, so your space is so clouded with suffering and agenda for survival, merely. So this is the world I grew up in. And I must say, it is very difficult for something good to come out of life lived in war. And it's also a commitment that right from my childhood, I did make a commitment to my mom uh, that, you know, regardless of the situation at hand, I will stick up, I will stick to my choice for peace and I'll never learn how to shoot a gun, I'll never pick up the gun to fight, to kill anybody. And that's the commitment I lived to date. I don't know how to shoot a gun. I, I actually have never touched a gun. So, but this is the kind of commitment. This is what inspired me when I was a child growing up in conflict, in war at the age of 13, when I saw my friends being taken, my brother taken, and the question was who next? And that the only way I thought to answer that question was, what can I do? Where am I in the picture of that change I was looking for? Of course, like anybody, young person growing up in, you know, in life, you would want to study, become a doctor, a pilot, become a teacher, professor, all these kinds of things. But my dream for such uh, positions was cut short by conflict, by suffering, by poverty, and all these kinds of things. And of course, still, when we wanted to get started, we had this feeling that we want to change our life, change the world, change our community. And then we had all the animations and dreams that would bring about change. We were going to, we were asking ourselves, why the war? Why the suffering? Why the problems? And we thought we had the answers for all these questions. But just when we came in, stepping forward, arrogantly thinking that we're going to bring our answers to all these questions, then we realized that the best way to answer these questions were to ask more questions. We started asking the questions, what are we doing with our life? The fact that we're in conflict, the fact that we're in war, we're surviving every day, we still have an opportunity to make a difference. And that was the question that motivated us from where we were to say, let us ask, see ourselves in the picture of change. And that's what brought us. And that's why I'm saying that even if we're celebrating our life today, it's a journey of a caterpillar, a journey of an egg was laid in an environment of conflict with the fragility uh, it had, it hatched into a caterpillar, a caterpillar of challenges in life, struggling as a caterpillar in the community where humanity is at, you know, on you, you can be eaten up by birds, you can be eaten up by, you can be burned, you can be sprayed. That's the gene of a caterpillar. You also went through the vulnerability of a, the pupa, the life of cocoon life we lived in war without much opportunity. And then from head to become a caterpillar, to become a pupa, and then to become a butterfly. In the Kiswahili, we call it the The butterfly we are seeing today is the butterfly that people appreciate. But how many of us pay attention to think, reflect, and see the pain and tears and cries and, and, and suffering the highs of the caterpillar? That's where we are. Today is the International Heroes Day. I want to celebrate the victims and survivors of war all over the world. To me, they are the, their heroes. And I celebrate them because even if they've been through the worst of the worst in life, they still chose to live in peace. They still chose to see life in other humanity. So this is the life I lived. This is the life I grew up in. And I thought I was uh, the best to do was to form this initiative, the African Youth Initiative Network, as an initiative to help me mobilize youth and communities in promoting the culture of peace and, and justice. But of course, it was something that people felt, why are you talking about peace that you have never lived? Why are you talking about justice that you don't even understand? You're not educated. So yeah, 
we just we just tired of living the life we are living, the life of pain, the life of survival, struggling with their own acceptance, and all that. Over the years, we struggled as much as we could to help the victims. We became a victim-centered human rights-based organization. And that's why our dream to stand, always stand in solidarity and support to provide opportunity for those who are affected by conflict, move from Uganda, work with the population in DRC, while working with the youth in the region. We have on many occasions been working with the African Union. I was part of the a group of uh, team members who participated in continental study on the role of youth in peace and security. I am I'm happy that our work is now being invited to support the population in Europe. This is what we are looking at, that the world we have is where we can all contribute. So I thought I should bring this bit so that we can know. In as much as we're talking about well-documented policies, documents, <clears throat> let us humanize the face of policy. Policies without human face is just a paper. Peace by proxy, care by proxy, human right by proxy is just an announcement, pronouncement without actions. Can we make sure that we're driven, give the human face of the peace we talk about, uh, give the human face of the justice we're talking about and human rights. So in line with where we are today, briefly, when you look at what is that, is what is lacking in the continent in terms of, you know, in Africa, we have a generation that is, a generation that is crying, a generation that is yearning for peace yearning for opportunities, but also they have to struggle with their own reality, trying every day to make an end meet in a situation where things are very difficult. It has become very, very challenging. And then we are looking at until when we put our personal experiences, so many young people been through hard time, just like me, when we decided that let us transform our pain, our suffering, our cry into an opportunity for leadership, to promote peace. Let us transform our tears, our cries for long to become waters and to cement and we we'll construct society that we saw destroyed so that we can build it again. And you know, because we are tired, we are worn out, people are depressed, people are failing emotionally, physically, economically. The question is what economic opportunity are we making available? Are we taking to the population who are offline? The population who was uneducated, uh, who are unskilled, semi-skilled, and few who are skilled. The unskilled population are the majority in Africa. These are people who went to school and they dropped out without any qualification. They're the majority. And then the semi-skilled are people completed education, but they don't have opportunity to serve anywhere. Unemployment is there. And then the few skilled are there. How are we working towards creating an environment to create larger economic opportunity, larger labor market for the semi-skilled and unskilled in the continent. Otherwise, we can't say they're unemployable because they are a ready force for recruitment. They are ready force for militarism. If we exclude them that they are unskilled, we are actually creating opportunity for them to be radicalized, to be taken away, to be, you know, in the wake of all these kind of things we're seeing as an opportunity. Why? What I want to say also, let us look at the population boom. The young people are, are many. They're the majority. They are forming a force. And it can become a negative force or a positive force, depending on when we tap into their strength. If you wait until when they are already in the streets, protesting, rioting, or become the harm, then we start intervening. That's when we are, we are, we are responding far too late. Because why people are wanted, young people, youth are wanted for the back-to-back -back political hostilities we are seeing in the region. The politics of tribalism, the ethnicity, the democracies, the, 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 the tribal ingredients in the African democracy is what really surprises. Let's think, how do we get on? My sister Chido talked about bringing and nurturing the culture, the spirit of unity, peace, and reconciliation. This is needed but this cannot be achieved by just good talk. We have to take African Union out of Addis Ababa, take it to Africa, take it to the community where the African people are. For far too long, we have centered our discussion, our engagement, our opportunities within our nation's capitals, and the majority are out in the community. Alone, we cannot do anything. Alone, we cannot go far. 
And they say that, you know, there's an African saying that a child will, a child will, an African child carry the tobacco will always grow up seeing the back of the mother's head. If there is discipline at the back of the mother's head, they will always learn from that. But if there's no discipline, if there's violence, if there's poverty, that's all they will see. And that's all, they will, it will be very difficult. Yes, we have opportunity, technology is there, but can we de-weaponize the technologies? There's too much weaponization of technology. There's too much weaponization of ethnicity. All this, can, this the, the super, the, the ethnic supremacy culture is what has defined and continued to tear apart the African democracy. We need to move beyond this. If Chido, my sister, would want to see a big change, we can create a powerful continental movement to popularize the concept of peace beyond our nation's capital. How many people can go today and can attend? Data is too expensive in the continent. The majority only gets data that can watch it for like two minutes and they can't access anything. So let us get a way of creating a movement of peace builders, the grassroots movement where we're promoting social justice that speaks to social unity. We are creating force of goodwill. We are not creating a force of warriors or something. And then you talked about the intergenerational mistrust issue. Yes, there's too much intergenerational mistrust and people use emotion to generate fear and sell the populist appeal, you know? This is working, why? Because the stigma, people feel uh, pushed out, yet we need generational will. We need political will. We need cultural will. We need interreligious will. If these wills are on, then we're able to support the group of young people because the political corruption, the chronic shortages of social services from medicine to education is crippling hope. Is, 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 is destroying the opportunity that's supposed to be, is closing the, the only window for big change in the continent. The unemployment, the deteriorating productivity, the authoritarianism in politics and human rights violations. These are all ingredients for gross economic uh, you know, hardship. The mismanagement that continues to will always create environment of catastrophe. And lastly, Let's get it clear. We need to reach a point that with what is going on in the world today, we have to go to the drawing board. We also need to see that. Let us look, let's, let us see Africa as ally in the global leadership, global political leadership, global economic leadership. This back-to-back -back, uh, segregation and discrimination of African people is not going to take us anywhere. You know that as for young people, when we end, when one is unfairly treated, when one is excluded, when one is left behind, that person definitely is at the risk of, you know, facing the prey to become to the corrosive politics of populism and will always result to harmful practices. This is what we can do. Otherwise, excluding them, unfairly treating them, we are just disenfranchising them and we are creating a very deteriorating situation that can only make them fall at risk of falling prey to the corrosive politics of populism and terrorism. I want to say thank you so much and I look forward to opportunity where we can you know, discuss our African politics based of, on personal stories. Unfortunately, our story started from the story of pain, a story of pain. It became a motivation to us. We decided let us assemble our pain, our suffering, became a motivation to us and somehow it became an inspiration for other people around the world. Thank you so much. Thank you, Victor. I think this uh, panel, perhaps I'll say uh, best panel so far. I'll take the credit for it. <laughs>